Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brookings. I'm Michael Hanlon here with Melanie Sisson of the Strobe Talbot Center on Security, Science, and Technology. We are honored to have the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General James McConville, with us today. General, I've been lucky to know you for a number of years, and we've hosted you before at Brookings. And uh, as you prepare to complete your tour as Chief of Staff, it's really a privilege to be able to host you yet again. And uh, I don't think of it as a farewell visit, but I think of it as really an, op an opportunity to honor and thank you for your service. And maybe I could ask everybody else to join me in a round of applause, please. Thank, thank you. So today we're going to talk with the general up here a bit. First me, then Melanie with some questions, and then you uh, to round out the hour. And first I'd like to say a couple more words about this distinguished soldier's amazing career. He's been in uniform for 42 years, actually 46 if you count all four years at West Point. Grew up in Quincy, Massachusetts, uh, near another young man uh, and promising, uh, promising future American named Joe Dunford, some of you may have heard of. A pretty amazing group of individuals following in the footsteps of John Adams and John Quincy Adams, all from that same small town in the Boston region. Uh, as I say, he went to West Point. He studied science there and also uh, earned a Master of Science degree from the Georgia Institute of Technology. He was commanding general of the 101st Air Assault Division. He served in both Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. He's been vice chief of the Army in addition to being chief. He's just had a remarkable career, and he's seen a lot. And so, General, uh, you know, we're all talking these days about the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, China, et cetera. But I don't want to begin there. I want to talk really about you as a soldier and your fellow soldiers and the state of the U.S. Army today, which, of course, is a big part of your day-to-day -day responsibility, and ask you about the all-volunteer force. How are we doing? And I'm just going to pack it all into one question. How are recruiting and retention doing? How is your ability to draw on a, an adequate pool of young Americans who might want to serve? How are you handling all the political pressures of you know, the fallout of January 6th on the one hand, the criticisms of woke culture on the other, a lot of, you got a lot of incoming to deal with in terms of, of what people think of the, you know, way in which our all-volunteer military is navigating this treacherous time in American politics. So could I just ask uh, to, to begin about how is our all-volunteer force today? Yeah, well, thank, thanks, and it's great to be here with you all. And, and you know, in the Army, it's really about people first. And, you know, People are the greatest weapon system, the greatest asset of the United States Army. When I talk about people, I'm talking about our soldiers from all three components. I'm talking about our civilians, I'm talking about our families, and I'm talking about our soldiers for life. So when I take a look at, you know, the, the people in the Army, I think we have the best leadership, you know, coming up into the Army. And these are combat-proven uh, veterans um, and as far as leadership goes, up and down the Army, over 20 years of combat, I think we're in great shape. Retention is at a historical high, so people that come in the Army are, are staying in the Army, and, and that's good. Recruiting right now is a challenge. You know, we, we did not have a good year uh, last year, and we are in a full-court press to inspire young men and women aside. And you mentioned, you know, different people saying different things. Quite frankly, I'm staying out of that. The, the military needs to stay out. We are nonpartisan. We are uh, apolitical. And quite frankly, we need to do that. And when we talk to you know, young men and women, one of the things that we found when we talked to recruiters was there was a lot of challenges after COVID with young men and women that want to serve meeting the standards. So what we did is we stood up a future soldier prep course. It's kind of like a boot camp for boot camp, if you will. And so far, we are finding pretty good results. About 95% of the young men and women that come to our Future Soldier Prep course make it through, go on to initial military training, and not only are they passing initial military training, they're actually exceeding the standards. They're taking the leadership positions. They're doing very well physically. So I think there's, there's something there. Uh, we just brought back Be All You Can Be, you know, for some of the older soldiers. That resonates. We've had different campaigns that, quite frankly, I I, I personally did not think hit the mark. I think this hits the mark because if you're a parent, and I'm a parent of uh, three soldiers, and you ask them why should your kid go in the military, you know, a, a good answer is you want your kid to be all they can be. Yep. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to invest in American youth. And just for everyone here, as I, I think we need to inspire young men and women to serve, not necessarily in the military, but across all the institutions that we have 
And that's really important for America. So if I could follow up on that, I think you were the one who taught me, General, five or six years ago, before COVID, and maybe when you were vice chief, if I remember the, the numbers correctly, about half of all of your recruits came from just 10% of the nation's high schools, as I remember you stating that statistic. And is, is, is what you just said a way to think about broadening the concept of service to make sure that the other 90% of the high schools perhaps don't catch up fully with military service, but that we really change the culture in the United States about national service writ large? And, and if so, how do we do that? I mean, it, yeah. your message is very helpful, but how do we broaden that message? Yeah, I think we have to expose more people uh, to the military service. You know, the, the statistic you quoted was is 44% of American youth that have a JROTC program go into the military. So you think about it, you know, JROTC program is in 10% of the high schools, but 44% go into the military, and they're not necessarily in JROTC, but they've been exposed to it. 83%-ish uh, of the young men and women that come into the military come from a military family. So we have become, in some ways, a military family business, and quite frankly, we need to be an American family business. And we're spending a lot more time uh, doing that, getting out, you know, you know, even the commercials. They're a chance to expose young men and women to what the military is all about. We're going back into the high schools. We're kind of not in the high schools during COVID. And then we're getting our, our divisions, you know, like the 101st, 82nd Airborne Division. They are actually in support of recruiting brigades, which is a really unusual relationship. But we want Americans to see what their military does. You could be anything you want to be in, in the United States Army. In fact, you can be all you can be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Army uh, has continued to downsize, partly because the surges of Iraq and Afghanistan are obviously over, uh, but also, I know, because of challenges with recruiting. And just one last question on this topic, because it, it, it is so central. Would you describe the current challenges with recruiting as nearing a crisis proportion, or do you feel that while there's some strain, there's some trouble, there's some inadequacy and shortfall, that this can be largely explained by the COVID period and largely addressed through things like your pre-boot camp, boot camp? And in other words, we got some problems, but it's not a crisis? Or is this one of the worst periods in the history of the all-volunteer force in terms of its ability to maintain the kind of numbers we need? Well, you know, like I said, we, we didn't have a good year last year. And what that means is in three to five years, if we don't retain or improve, we're going to have some challenges with the non-commissioned officers who are the backbone of our army. So where I sit right now, we are not in an absolute crisis, but we don't want to get to that crisis. And so we are pulling out the stops uh, in the army. It's our number one priority when it comes to recruiting. Uh, and it's not just a recruiting command challenge. It's everyone's challenge. In the Army, everyone's a recruiter. And, you know, and, and we're sending out, you know, one of the, the best um, examples we've seen is just getting our soldiers out to their high school, taking our soldiers of the year and, and going back to their high school. We had, we had a young man who just finished basic training, go back to his wrestling. He went to a wrestling tournament, and he came back and he signed up 19 kids, you know? So, I mean, what we have to do is people have to be able to see themselves in, in, in the Army, see themselves in, in the military, especially places where they're not used to seeing what the military is all about. Right? If, if I could, I'd like to turn to the war in Ukraine, not to talk about the specific next phases that you may be anticipating, yeah. and that's, I realize, more General Cavoli um, and national military and strategic leadership, but from an army perspective and a soldier perspective, what have you learned? What have you yeah. been surprised by? And how, you know, then we'll get to how that maybe affects your own priorities for how the U.S. Army should be modernizing and adapting. But what have you learned by watching you know, the Ukraine? You know, war? I think we're learning a whole bunch by watching Ukraine. And, and I kind of, when I take a look at history and I put, try to put it in context, when the senior leaders, last time we did a major transformation in the Army was, was in 1980s, late 70s, 1980s. Time before that was 1940, before World War II. Every 40 years, you know, most of us would argue the Army needs to transform. In 1973, the leaders at that time were coming out of Vietnam, and they looked at the Arab-Israeli war, and they got a sense of what future combat may look like that. And they took that, and they came out with new doctrine, they came out with new organizations, training, the big five, as we like to talk about, and, and the all-volunteer force. And that's what drove them 
And quite frankly, that's what we've used for the last 40 years, incrementally improving all those systems. We're in a different place right now. And as we take a look at Ukraine, what we're seeing and, and confirming some of the things we've been talking about is going to be a multi-domain fight. So if you think about it, it's not just contested on the land. And that's a vicious land fight that's going on. It's contested in the air. You know, everything's getting shot down. A lot of things are, you know, you're going to fly airplanes, you're going to have to fly them or drones um, in a contested environment. We've seen uh, ships sunk. When the last time we saw uh, ships actually sunk, so we're contested on the sea. We're certainly contested in cyber, and we're certainly contested in space. So we're going to have to be able to operate uh, in that environment. And that is driving our, our doctrine. It's driving new organizations. It's driving our modernization priorities and, and quite frankly, all our personnel-type systems. So as, as we take a look at, you know, What's, what's going on? Uh, Long-range precision fires. You know, people talk about HIMARS being a game changer. Well, the Army's developing, you know, the prison strike missile, developing uh, mid-range capabilities going to sink ships. We're developing hypersonics. All these capabilities are going to be in the hands of our soldiers by the end of next year into, into the next year, and we're seeing that's really important. And if you're going to do long-range precision fires, you have to do long-range precision targeting or deep sensing. You've got to have the ability to find targets and you have to be able to do it at the speed of relevance. And so it's great that we have systems that go very fast. It's great we have systems that go very far. But the secret sauce is what we call convergence. How quickly can you take that information from the sensors, get it into an integrated battle command system, and quickly get it to lethal means that are going to apply uh, those effects? And, and so we're seeing it. Things like non-commissioned officer corps. You know, we're very blessed. If you're going to have a complex plan, and quite frankly, if you took what the Russians had, it was a very complex plan when the initial attack was five axes. They were doing airborne operations, air assault operations, amphibious operations. And you have to have a highly trained force be able to do that. And you have to have non-commissioned officers who have been around to lead those small units to make it happen. Logistics, logistics, logistics. Um, you know, I, I'm very uh, proud of what our logisticians have done as far as supporting, but also put us in a place that we can reinforce allies and partners. Um, another, you know, when people ask me at the beginning of the conflict, they go, hey, you know, the, the javelins and the stingers work very, very well in the defense of Kiev, so you don't need tanks anymore. The tanks are stuck by the side of the road, and, you know, my kind of, you know, response to that is you don't need tanks unless you want to win. And, and what I mean by that is what you really need is combined arms. And you need combined services, and you need combined allies and partners. And you have to all work together and take advantage of the strengths that each uh, system has, each service has, each branch has, and bring them together to present, you know, to provide courses of action for our commanders, but more importantly, provide dilemmas for our adversaries. You want to, be, you know, you want to throw a whole bunch of balls, and they don't know which one's coming at them, and that's how you win. Just one follow-up on that, and then I'd like to talk about Army modernization today. But your point about tanks is intriguing, and we could have a whole conversation just on that. But I guess what's, what's got my curiosity is watching that Russian attempt a year ago from the north, where they send in a lot of vehicles on a predictable path of right. approach uh, along major roads. I guess there was some, you know, it was winter, there, were, there, were, there was snow on the side of the roads, maybe hard to drive off road. Some of it was perhaps light snow. Anyway, not the easiest environment, at least for support vehicles. Maybe some of the tanks could have gotten across. But the Russians came straight down those highways. And what struck me is they didn't have proper unpredictability of their approach, but nor did they have dismounted infantry along the side to try to snuff out those javelin-wielding teams. Am I partly correct in that analysis? And if so, does that mean that um, the tanks really are just as useful as ever if you operate them correctly, or are they marginally less useful? No, I, I think if, um, if the Russians had done combined arms and you know, had, had infantry with tanks, we never employ tanks without infantry, but, but also attack aviation, also artillery, also uh, intelligence gathering platforms, and it's very hard to fire a javelin if you're taking artillery. You don't want to be hanging around, you know, as artillery is kind of raining in on you. And, and what, you want, you, what you don't want to do is present, you know, your adversary with one dilemma. You know, if they only have to focus on the tanks coming down the road, that's, if that's all they have to focus at and they're canalized, and oh, by the way, you throw in the logistics, you didn't have gas for your tanks, you didn't have parts for your tanks, you didn't have ammunition for your tanks, um, you probably didn't set yourself up for success. I think, and again, I, I, I don't know for a fact, but I think they thought they could just drive in 
in armored vehicles and people would surrender. But that's not, you know, kind of what happens. And as commanders, you'd always plan for the worst case. You know, there was going to be a big fight. And how do you set the conditions for moving very, very quickly, um, you know, an armored type force? You know, if you go back to history, and you see forces, you know, like, you know, the 101st Airborne Division, they would jump in and seize the bridges. You know, it was all about getting the bridges because that was critical terrain. And then you can quickly move tanks and other things very, very quickly through. So you have got to do combined arms. So now to segue to what you're trying to do with the Army and to build on what you just said about the history lesson of previous transformation, of course, uh, the Army did try to transform itself again in the early 2000s with the future combat system. And I know there were some benefits from that effort, but overall, the, the, the big idea didn't quite pan out the way people had hoped. And there were other setbacks in the 90s with various kinds of weapon systems as well. And so I guess now you've got you and before you, uh, General Milley and Secretary Mark Esper when he was the Secretary of the Army, you were talking about six major areas of modernization. And I wanted to invite you to maybe update us on one or two of them. I mean, you already talked about long-range fires. There's vertical lift. There's the network. Yeah. There's the soldier. Uh, air and missile defense. I think I'm forgetting one. Uh, maybe it is mechanized uh, vehicles and, and tanks. And out of that group of six, are there one or two that are showing the most promise that you're happiest about and one or two that are lagging? Yeah, well, I think, you know, we talked to, you know, I talk about 24 uh, signature system. So there's six modernization priorities. Within that, uh, there's 34 kind of major systems coming to bear. Uh, 24 of those systems are going to either be fielded in testing or in, in, in the hands of soldiers in 23. And, 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 and so that is pretty quick because these things were, you know, five, when you look at acquisition programs, a lot of time it takes a long time to get things in place. And I think it's because we're doing things differently. You know, we're moving away from spending years trying to define the requirements and then turning it over to our, um, our project managers and, and, and industry and saying, come back in seven, ten years with a product. And meanwhile, technology has really changed and the requirements are really no, no longer relevant. So kind of, you know, in a, 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 scumnail, a, a thumbnail sketch of how we're doing business is we're saying, hey, we want something that kind of does this, it goes this fast, it goes this far, come back to us with a white paper on what you think you can do. And, and this opens up to a whole bunch of uh, partners, and, and so we may get 100 white papers to say, okay, we got 100 white papers and what this is going to be, we're going to pick 10, and you're going to get $100,000 each or something to go to the next step. Now come back with an initial design, and we take a look at what industry says they can do, and and, you know, what's really critical is what I've always found is you can do a lot on PowerPoint. It's a lot easier to do things on PowerPoint and paper than actually build this stuff. So you always want to be kind of thinking about that as you go forward. But, and then we go to initial design. And, and meanwhile, we're updating our characteristics. We're not to requirements yet. We're saying, hey, we, you know, we want to see this thing. And then we go into detailed design. Then we go into prototyping. And, and so with the prototyping, we're able to drive or fly before we buy, which is very, very different than we used to do it. So if you look at future vertical lift, the future long-range assault aircraft, the, the two competitors are actually flying those things. So we, can, we know, and, and they are transformational in how they're changing the way aircraft. They're not helicopters anymore because one's a tilt rotor configuration and one is advancing blade concept, and it's allowing them to get the speed and range, but we know they can do that because they've been able to do it. We just picked um, a, a new vehicle for a mobile protective fire. And that is, went through the same thing. We put in the hands of soldiers at the 82nd Airborne Division. We let them use those vehicles for six to nine months. We got a good idea of what they wanted or didn't want, and we're bringing them forward. So we're driving before we're buying. We're flying before we're buying. I'd say one of the you know, systems that um, is not moving as fast, uh, but I think is one of the most transformational, is IVAS the integrated visual augmentation system. And to understand that, um, you know, you, you have to kind of look into the future. And, and what I mean by that is we, we have night vision goggles, and we've incrementally improved those, and we have, a, we, we have a set called the Enhanced Night Vision Goggles Bravo, which is really a good set of goggles. Yeah. And it, it fuses ambient light and flare. The troops love it. It's got, you know, it, it, it's really very helpful as a very good set of night vision capability. 
I've asked for something completely different, and I, I use I've used the uh, the analogy of like the the phone. You know, we went from phone on the wall, worked our way through iterations, cordless phone, to a cell phone, and we had a very very good cell phone. Then all of a sudden, you know, the computer folks came up with a different idea. They got the smartphone, which transformed how we use phones. You know, for you know the younger people here, we didn't have things. We used to have these things called cameras. You know, we didn't you'd take pictures with our phone. We didn't navigate with our phones. We didn't watch movies with our phones. I have Eisenhower's phone in, in the Eisenhower bedroom in my house. You know, it's an old dial-type phone. That is what iVest is going to be. And people just got to be persistent, and they got to be consistent and stay with it. And it's clunky right now. But what that is going to do is transform the way our leaders and soldiers can operate in the battlefield. And, you know, we have to be patient, but we have to be... Uh, we, we have to get it done because, you know, when you start to see what you can do, you can bring video in. You, you're you going to have man-on-man teaming. You're going to have unman unman teaming. You have all these type of things going on in the battlefield, and you want to have the ability to pass data to leaders so they can see it in a heads-up display. Just one last question for me, and then I'll hand off to Melanie. I wanted to talk a little bit about how the Army is going to respond to the new security demands in Europe, not by getting into General Cavoli's portfolio so much as yours about how is an army of now 450,000 active duty soldiers, smaller than you've been in a long time, how is that army going to handle maintaining modest but still significant footprints in a lot of parts of the world where the European footprint is now likely to grow, I think probably steady state, although I realize decisions haven't yet been made. And in particular, I guess to bring it to a specific question, would it be better if the army is going to be in eastern NATO territory, Romania or the Baltics, at least with a couple of battalions, maybe a brigade? Would it be better to base that unit there permanently rather than try to maintain it with the, with the rotational system that then winds up requiring three or four units to sustain one because of the recovery and preparation time? Are, are we better off thinking about whatever footprint we're going to have in the eastern member states that it sh- perhaps should be a permanent stationing as opposed to a rotational one? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's not either or. It's, it's, it's a bunch of all. And, and when I take a look at it, as you know, in Europe, we have permanent station troops. You know, we have troops in Italy, we have troops in Germany, and we have some uh, throughout Europe. And, and, and that makes sense in, in some places. We also have rotational troops, which, again, uh, um, it has value in the fact it gives us flexibility on how they move in, how they, how they, uh, how they move out, but it also gives us value in that you don't have to bring families. You know, some places you may not have the capacity to bring families and schools and hospitals, and, and you know, that's a fairly significant number uh, to do that, so, so you want to balance that. The other thing is, which we showed, is the benefit of having prepositioned stocks. You know, if, I mean, if, if you want, you know, the, the 1st Brigade of the 3rd Infantry Division we were able to deploy an armored brigade combat team in a little over a week, which if you, you know, understand what goes on behind that. And the reason we were able to do it was because the, their equipment, there was a modernized brigade combat team of armor sitting over there that was maintained with logisticians. And so, in fact, the logisticians are the ones that actually moved it to the range. So when they showed up, you know, we basically could move. We just had to move the people in the airplane. They got off the airplane. They were ready to take over these tanks and conduct uh, operations. So I think it's a little of both. And what we're going to do is, you know, take what we have and provide options. And then as far as w- where we're permanent and not permanent, those are, as you know, those are the decisions made well above us. Thank you. Melanie. Great. Well, first, thanks, Mike, for starting off the conversation with such an important um, set of topics. And, sir, thanks very much for joining us here today. Um, Let's stick with what Mike just brought up, but make it a little bit more general and put it in some broader context. Um, And when you look around the world today at the changed strategic environment, that informs all of this work that you're doing with and on behalf of uh, the U.S. Army. So um, in that broader geopolitical context, how do you think about how big the Army needs to be and about where it needs to be now? Well, when I, when I take a look at, you know, first of all, we, we want presence and, uh, and support of the national defense strategy. And I think I, when I use Europe as an example, it shows how quickly we can respond to reassure allies and partners and deter any further aggression. And that's because the theater is set. You know, we have strong allies and partners that are there. We work very close together. There's been rehearsals with Defender Series where you can quickly move, you know, systems across Europe to respond 
and, and, and then you're there. And then we take a look at, you know, the, the Indo-Pacific. You know, we have some places where we're very present, other places we're not. And those relationships are, are really important. As we talk to decision makers, we want to make sure, hey, if we want to do something like this, we need to have this capability in this region or we're going to have to uh, do it differently. And what I see from a, uh, a chief of staff of the Army standpoint is I want to make sure we can provide the capabilities that the National Command Authority needs to do to, to assist in, in, in the combatant commanders and national defense strategy. And a lot of people say, like, hey, you, don't, you know, like in Europe, you don't need long-range precision fires because no one will ever let you bring them in. Well, that may change, you know. I mean, there's people that are very eager to have long-range precision fires now, and, and maybe if, you know, three or four years pass, they wouldn't. So someone is, is providing the capabilities that are trained and ready to go, and if we're asked to do that, we, we can do that. But having some type of access and presence in, in the regions we're going to operate, I think, is extremely important. You mentioned the national defense strategy. And in the past, you've also spoken um, very clearly about the, the difference between uh, competing and being in conflict. So you can compete below the threshold of conflict. Um, and the national defense strategy uh, in 2022 incorporated the idea of campaigning. Okay. And so do you, do you think about those two as similar constructs, competing below the threshold and campaigning? Are they different? Um, and in either case, what's the role of the Army? Well, I, I see, you know, the campaigning is, you know, how, how do we work in a region and, and, and build uh, the capabilities, the ca capacity, and the competence, and, and quite frankly, the will to fight over our allies and partners. We, we are never going to fight alone. And, you know, I think as you take a look at Ukraine, it's a, it's a great example of a country that we were able to help with their capabilities, we are able to help with their capacity, we are able to help. Um, with their competence by the training we're doing, but they provided the will to fight. They provide the commitment to defending their country, and I think that needs to be the framework for how we look at, uh, you know, campaigning. And, and I would argue that, um, you know, country it has a lot more will to fight if they have the capabilities, the capacity, and the competence, and, and they know people are going to be supporting them. So I think that's how I see campaigning. Uh, we've set up new organizations, the Security Force Assistance Brigades, to help build that partner capacity. We certainly have special forces do a great job of doing that around the world. And we have National Guard state partnerships, again, working with our allies and partners uh, to, to build their capabilities. And we do lots of exercises in, in our critical um, theaters to make sure that, that we're ready and we've kind of worked through some problem sets. And, you know, one of the, you know, at least, you know, when I was at West Point, um, President Reagan gave a very famous speech at our graduation, the Peace Through Strength uh, speech, and um, that's kind of stuck with me. How do we get peace through strength? And, you know, the best way to win without fighting is demonstrate you can win by fighting. And we're going to do that as a joint force. We're going to do that as a combined force, and that's what I think the campaigning is all about. You mentioned peace through strength and um, the idea of deterring conflict. And deterrence, of course, is um, on everybody's minds these days, um, not just because of the efforts um, prior to Putin's um, egregious actions in Ukraine, but also, of course, because of concern over Taiwan and potential um, PRC interest in, in using force against that island. When you look at the joint force today, um, how would you assess uh, our ability to deter, um, whether it's that specific scenario in Taiwan or if there are other areas that you see that we ought to be paying attention to that you think about in a de yeah. deterrence framework? Well, when I, when I think about deterrence, first of all, I think we have the world's greatest military. We have the world's greatest Navy. We have the world's greatest Air Force, Marine Corps, Space Force, and, and Army. And I, I think people should not take that, that lightly. I've, I've, fought uh, as a joint force over many, many years, and uh, I, I have, a, you know, a lot of confidence in our ability to do things. That doesn't mean the fact we're ready today that we, we should rest on our laurels, and as we look around the world, people are um, certainly increasing their capabilities, and, and, and that's something we're certainly concerned about, and we need to be ready to do that, and we need to do the same thing. But when I take a look at, you know, how we're shifting, uh, and I won't get into specific scenarios, but you know, if someone's considering, you know, trying to, say, hypothetically seize an island-type structure, hypothetically, 
you know, I mean, the way you, you know, first of all, you'd want to make sure that that country that is defending that island has the capabilities, the capacity, and the competence, and the will to fight, you know, as a starting point. Uh, but there's also other things that can be done is, is you know, if, if they are going to fight and they are going to resist, then that's going to require, you know, the adversary to do some type of amphibious or airborne operation, whether that's an airborne uh, parachute operation or, or an air assault operation. Then you have to think, well, how do you prevent that from happening? What type of capabilities and capacity do you have to do that? And I think that's why you end up developing you know, certainly anti-ship capabilities, and that can be done from the sea, it can be done from the air, it can be done from the ground. Um, Anti-airborne air assault, uh, that's, you know, shooting their airplanes down, their helicopters down, and, and, and so you, you build those capabilities, and, and, and you build them with the amount of strength that, that may deter someone from trying to do that. You know, amphibious operations um, of that ilk are very challenging. You've got to go back to D-Day to really take a look at how that was done. And then you got to take a look at, you know, things like, you know, D-Day, we didn't have the intelligence apparatus that we have today. You know, you had patent up running around trying to convince people to come from a different direction. I'm not so sure you could do that today. And, and, and then logistics. It's about logistics, logistics, logistics. You, you could see with a landlocked battle we're seeing in Ukraine right now, it's very challenging for one side to get logistics and make all these type things happen. And then you put in, um, you know, the idea that you have to supply an amphibious force coming across. So there's there's a lot of potential there that uh, that could be deterred with the, with the right um, capabilities, capacity, and competence, and and certainly the will to fight. The um, those are three C's and one W, if I'm counting. C three W. That's my that's my <laughs> that's new acronym. Right. I'm throwing it around. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to you know, it's a, you got to. In the, in the Army, you always got an acronym, right? C3W? Yeah. That's right. It helps us all out with our, those of us with failing memories. But, um, you know, you, all of that begins with the people um, who serve. And, right. you know, you and Mike touched on this. I, I wanted to uh, go a little bit more in depth on one area in particular. I know you've been invested in talent management yeah. in the Army for a while now. And in particular, there's been some changes to the personnel management system and command assessment. And there's also something called the software factory yeah. now. Um, yeah. So uh, if you'd share a little bit about one or more of those things with us and yeah, I tell think, us why you know, and where uh, they're at. Well, first of all, I think talent management is one of the most important things we do. You know, I, I talked about people as our greatest uh, weapon system. So we are tr moving the Army from what I would call an industrial age personnel management system to a 21st century talent management system and really trying to manage the individual talents where they're not interchangeable parts in this big industrial age system, which is a fundamental change. You, you mentioned the software factory. So um, we know in the future we're going to have to code. You know, there's going to be a lot of algorithms out there, artificial intelligence. Uh, we're going to have coding going on the battlefield. And we take a look at convergence, which is our, I consider, secret sauce, moving data very, very quickly, taking advantage of artificial intelligence, countering algorithms. All these things are going on. We're going to need young men and women that can code. And so we've set up a, a software factory. And what's really interesting, it, it kind of highlights some of the challenges that we have in our talent management system. We tend to manage people by two variables in the Army. You're a captain of infantry. You're a sergeant of engineers. But we don't see the entire picture of the knowledge, skills, and behavior that they bring uh, to the Army. So we, we actually have a specialist, an E4, at the software factory that has no formal training but codes at the Ph.D. level. He just grew up coding. He loves it. And we just happened to find him by a lark. But the future is we want to be able to know the talents that people have. And we see it happen all over the place. When I was a one-star uh, in Afghanistan, we were, we were building out um, most of Afghanistan. And I had a lot of great guard and reservists that were working for us. And so I asked them to fill out an Excel spreadsheet. I said, what do you do in real life? You know, I mean, I, I got it. You're, you know, your captain, major, colonel, sergeant. What do you do in real life? Well, there was a supply sergeant there who owned an engineering design firm in his civilian life. He is the person, that sergeant, who designed all the airfields and all the forward operating bases. And that struck me. You know, I said, wow, we, we are kind of missing something here. And then, as many of you knew, agriculture was a, was a, uh, a focus area. So if you, if you don't notice, I'm from Boston. Um, you know, in Boston, we have pictures of farms. We don't do a lot of farming up there, you know, you know and, and those type things. 
But we had folks from Nebraska and Iowa, the professional farmers, and so they were able to snap these agribusiness development teams. So what we're really trying to do with talent management is get the right people and the right jobs and, and, and be able to manage their talents. And so we're putting in place, we're putting in this integrated personnel and pay system, which has only taken nine years, and it's almost there, but, but you know, you have to stay consistent and persistent to get these systems into place. But I think the future is talent management, where you are managing not two variables, maybe 25 variables, and you take advantage of artificial intelligence, and you quickly can get the right person in the right job at the right place. Well, I'm going to ask one more question before yeah. turning it over to this nice crowd here. Um, you know, Mike touched on what has been a very long and accomplished career uh, that you've had um, that I'm sure has been full of hard work and some heartache and a lot of challenge. Um, what has been for you in this position or over the course of your career the most rewarding part um, of your service in the Army? I, I think it's the people. I, I, I'd like to say it, it's this person, but... You know, it's just, you know, I've, every day is a great day in the United States Army because I believe we serve with the world's greatest soldiers. And, you know, having been in some very challenging situations and see young men and women rise to the occasion, we're in the multiple combat tours, multiple places around the world, uh, it's just really special. And I, I just wish everyone would have that opportunity to see what that's like. Because sometimes, you know, it, it you, you don't realize, you know, the system can be hard, the system can be cold, but the people are what it's all about at the end of the day. Great. All right, we have some microphones coming around um, for questions from the audience. Um, you will be allotted 45 seconds to generate and ask your question at the 45 second mark. I will interrupt very rudely and pass <laughs> it over for the answer. So, um, hands up for questions, please. Where, do, where should we begin? Um, let's start with the gentleman here in the glasses. Oh, there's a microphone coming for you, sir. Thank you. And please um, um, announce your name and where you're from. Yeah, Sam Scove, uh, Defense One. Uh, so you talked about retention, sir, and it being at an all-time high. I'm just wondering what you thought the reasons for uh, that high, those high numbers are and if that will apply to this new generation of recruits that you're seeking to attract. Well, I hope so. I, th I, think, um, I think it's because of leadership. I think it's the same thing that, you know, many people come to the Army, they're not sure what it's all about, but once they get in the Army and they – meet the people they're serving with, and they find the purpose and the, and the difference they're making, and uh, they want to stay, and we, and we want them to stay. But we are, I tell, you know, our commanders, we're in a war for talent. We are competing uh, for our soldiers' talents, and we should never take them for granted, and that's why it's about people first. Great. Next set of questions. Great. Right here. Thank you. Uh, John Harper with Defense Scoop. Uh, General, you mentioned IVAS earlier. How confident are you that the Army and Microsoft have a plan in place to overcome some of the challenges that the program has run into? And just more broadly, how concerned are you that some of the publicity surrounding uh, some of the challenges with IVAS will erode political support for that program, either on the Hill or in other corridors of power? Well, I, I'm confident uh, in, in the team that's, that's uh, developing the product. I, I've seen major... Uh, progress and and I guess when I look out there and I see how far they 've come, if you can envision what it will do in the future, you know um, it is really going to make a difference if you you know stay it's it 's kind of like when we first got you know the cell phone we thought that was great you know I like blackberries you know i I, I kind of was very comfortable with that, but as new technology came in, if we want to be in the leading edge of technology we 've got to go with technology. And it's going to take some time. And what I've learned is you have to be persistent and consistent on getting the things done. The first time you, you know, run into a little roadblock, if you stop and turn around, you'll never get anything done. And so we just need to stay with it. Uh, we need to keep our soldiers on that. We need to, you know, um, make sure that we reinforce what is happening. And, and, and it's like every single major system that we have. If you go back and study the history, even the big five, and go back and say, what was this you know, tank like? What was this helicopter like? What was this like? And you find out it's not all perfect. And what you really want to do is get you know, what I call the A model or the alpha model in the hands of soldiers. We've done that right now. We realize it's bigger than we want it, and it's got some, you know, some systems place. But if you take a look at where we're going with the, the 1.2 model, uh, we just need to – it's, it's going to happen. And when we visualize what it's going to end up being – uh, five to ten years now, people go, wow, how, how do we ever operate without this system? 
I have an audience question here, um, and I'm going to just read it directly. Sure. So, you recently stated you could see a third multi-domain task force in the Indo-Pacific alongside the one already in Europe and a potential fifth one focused on global contingencies. The Army had earlier indicated that the fourth MDTF would be focused on the Arctic. So do you see a third MDTF in the Indo-Pacific as a more pressing need, and would you still consider sending up an additional MDTF in the Arctic? Yeah, I think when we take a look at, you know, the five we're going to have, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty focused on having three. And, and right now we're doing the analysis, so any type of, any, any time we do basing options, we, we take a look at where uh, that will be. The, the other thing about the multi-domain task forces is multiple components of that. So some pieces could be, in other, you know, or units could be other places. It comes with long-range precision fires, it comes with air and missile offense. And some of that may be positioned uh, based on the scenario. So we, we want it to be agile. We want to be able to move the system uh, as needed. You know, right now we have one in Hawaii. We have one at Joint Base um, lewis McCord, And we have one uh, in, in Germany. But we're able to move that around and as we build out the capabilities. They are a task force. And when we, when we think about... You know, the, the long-range fires battalions that come, that, that, that could be composed of hypersonics. It could be mid-range capability, which will sink ships. It could be PRISM. And that we're going to see as we, you know, as the situation changes, it could be any of all of those in a system. And then air and missile defense that comes with it. So it's hard to say exactly that, you know, and it could go in the Arctic. It could go where it's going to be required uh, based on, you know, what we see, uh, whether it's a campaigning threat or a uh, reassuring a deterrence thing. So we are keeping our options open as we move forward. I'm at risk of abusing the privilege of having a microphone attached to me instead of having to wait for someone to, to come and bring it. But um, I, I am going to do it nonetheless and ask you, you know, you've, you've talked a bit about the, the value of jointness and um, being able to converge data and operate together. Do you have an eye on joint professional military education? Do you see what is being taught in, in those classrooms? Um, do you think that the frame on that is right? Are we teaching the right things uh, in terms of how we think about competition, in terms of the requirements of working jointly, in terms of um, what a future war fight might look like? Yeah, I think I'm sure we can do improvement. I'm sure as people take a look at it, we can always improve, uh, or, you know, first of all, Army, you know, kind of tra uh, professional military education and the joint professional military education. I think we've put a lot of that into, you know, our, our war colleges, and so we're sharing the same vision. The National Defense Strategy has been integrated into the curriculum, so we're, you know, spending a lot more time uh, studying about, you know, future uh, pacing challenges probably than we were in, in the past. And I think the young, uh, younger officers and non-commissioned officers realize certainly the importance of doing joint operations and, and, and many doing combined operations. And so I see that, that, that growing as we move forward. Okay. Um, audience questions. Here, please, in the middle. Sir, I'm uh, Harold Hagen. I'm Norwegian Defense Attaché. Uh, um, I think every question should start with a very big thank you to the U.S. leadership in Ukraine. Without the U.S. leadership, I'm afraid not much would happen. So thank you very much. Um, as we look in the rearview mirror, uh, one year ago, a war started in Europe. It's, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling that we are not that we're not better. Um, and I'm, I'm curious now that uh, you are developing the U.S. Armed Forces, the U.S. Army for the future with a focus on the Indo-Pacific, what's happening in the, in the high north, uh, what's happening in Europe now. Um, how, how has this war in Ukraine changed your perceptions on the future development of, of, of the U.S. Army. Uh, I, would, I would be curious to hear you elaborate. And, of course, with, with Sweden okay. and Finland joining NATO as well, which was, as a Norwegian, it's extremely good to see, even though the circumstances that it, it happened under is terrible. But, yeah. uh, well, we're getting them into NATO. So thank you. Well, th well thank you for that question, and, and thank you for your partnership. And I've had a chance to visit your country and, and very strong partners. But, you know, it, it wasn't maybe three or four years ago 
when many thought that any type of conflict in Europe was unimaginable. Even, even as, you know, um, we saw the situation develop, there were many, many people that even haven't seen the intelligence could not believe that the Russians would conduct an unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. I mean, it just, it's, you know, and I think we've all, you know, luckily we've, we've stayed strong together. Um, you know, we certainly could be stronger, and I think a lot of the countries in, in Europe are realizing that NATO does matter, and, you know, having strong allies and partners matter, and that, you know, getting back to my C3, th C C3W, uh, we need to do that, you know. I mean, I think each of the countries is, is, is taking a hard look at their capabilities, their capacity, and the competence of their soldiers, and, and quite frankly, that drives their will to fight, because they're going to have to defend themselves. And, you know, as I take a look around the world, you know, what we're trying to do with, with our army is certainly support the national defense strategy, which is, you know, sees China as a, a pacing challenge, not an advers adversary, but as a pacing challenge. But, you know, Russia is also a key threat, and we're seeing that it's a real threat with what's happening. And what we want is a, an army that can do a lot of different things and work very closely with you all. You know, we, we stood up... Um, an Arctic Airborne Division, the 11th Airborne Division, that is focused on the Arctic. And, and you know, you all and, and our friends in Sweden and Finland who are experts in Arctic warfare and do extremely well, we're working together. We're learning a lot by coming together. And I think as we take a look at the future, uh, if you're going to do integrated deterrence, which is more than just military, but it's economic, it's dipl diplomatic, and information-type operations, is there's, there really is strength through strong allies and partners, all sharing the same vision of what should happen in coming together, and we are much stronger together. So, you know, we're, we're Arctic capability, we're developing long-range precision fires, and a lot of our systems I go long ranges. You know, when you take a look at some of the aircraft we're developing, you know, if you're getting 300 to 350 miles an hour out of an aircraft um, in the ranges, and then you're in a much better place, you know, in, in the Indo-Pacific where you may have to go further and farther. And you, you, you're creating options uh, for the combatant commander over there. You've got long-range precision fires that you can target. You know, all those things come together as we work together as a team. And, and, and that's what I see the future is. I see strong allies and partners. I see us working together. We're doing a lot of work right now on convergence, which means that we've got to be able to pass data through all our allies and partners, because that's where, quite frankly, I think you get the edge or advantage that you need in any type of potential conflict. Another audience question that was submitted ahead of time, which we all really appreciate, um, the engagement of the Brookings audience. How does, and you touched on this a little bit, but perhaps an opportunity to elaborate on, on the role of the Army Reserve and the Army National Guard? Yeah, I think the, the role of the Reserve and National Guard is, is, is just something that we could not live without. You know, take a look at uh, in our force, 52% of the Army is in the Guard of the Reserves, and we have asked the National Guard and Reserves to do all types of things uh, inside the United States, whether it's support of COVID, it's national disasters, it's on the border, uh, social unrest, and then deploying uh, overseas with their state partnership programs and the combat, and you know even driving buses, you name it. Um, our, our National Guard and Reserves have been like a Swiss Army knife, if you will. Uh, they, we ask them to do just about anything, and, and they, they do it. Uh, but they still need to be ready for their combat mission. That's what they exist to do. And they have to be ready. And um, I'm just really proud of our National Guard and Reserves for what they do every single day for the country. And, you know, they have a very challenging time because most of them have civilian jobs, too. So they got to balance that uh, with their military careers. Okay. Questions from the audience. We've got a gentleman in the far back here, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, General. <clears throat> Having visited Ukraine as a United Nations delegate on civil and human rights, you're right on time you say logistics. Um, and I understand from NGA, the National Geospatial Agency, that real-time visualization mapping can help give good on-time and real-time situational awareness as to the conflict in Ukraine. Is the Army also engaged in using visualization surveillance and mapping in real-time to give, I guess, up-to-date situational awareness of the uh, conflict in Ukraine? 
Well, we certainly have capabilities um, that run the whole gamut of what you're talking about, you know, from deep sensing to update mapping and all those type of things. And then um, when it comes to the Ukrainians, uh, there's, there is some information that if, if it's shared, but, you know, right now um, they are doing an incredible job uh, getting after that, making sure uh, they, they, they are very talented in the ability to locate and engage targets. And we had another from um, one of our federal uh, executive fellows here at the Brookings Institution. General Brad McNally with Brookings coming from the, uh, the Coast Guard. Thanks for your time. So I just wanted to ask as an Army aviator and you're getting prepared to uh, step away from a very distinguished career here in the next few months. Uh, what are your thoughts on Army aviation currently and how excited are you about uh, some of the things coming down the, the pipe in the next few years? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm, you know, if I talk about Army aviation, but I think Army it, it really military aviation uh, in, in Coast Guard and, and across the front. We, 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 we have the world's greatest pilots and, and at scale, too. And I take a look at Army aviation. You go to some countries, there's a few people that can fly night vision goggles or maybe shoot at night or do some of those type of things. We have a force uh, of aviation professionals across all the services that is extremely highly trained uh, and can operate in the worst weather. They can operate at night. They can do the most difficult missions. And, you know, and what I've seen, you know, I see it more as a commander, command the 101st Airborne Division. We had 250 aircraft and seeing what they would do in combat. Uh, we, we, and, and then even the idea that you can maintain, you know, you know part of it, you get to the, you know, fueling and rearming and all those type things that I see and aviators across the entire force. So I, 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 I you know, just think the world of our, our aviators and what they do uh, for this country, along with the maintainers and all the professionals that go along with that. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I, as I said, Mike, took advantage of my opportunity, so I should, I feel, to even-handed and fair should make that available to you as well if you have one more you'd like to ask the general. Well, I'll follow up on the aviation question. Thanks. Yeah. And, and to ask about the... The, the status of the air fleets themselves, the, the helicopters, the planes. And, you know, I always regret that going back to Secretary Rumsfeld and thereafter we haven't really published as much data on readiness. I know we decided it's classified, but I'm not expecting numbers so much as your overall sense of airframe availability. You talked about how hard people work on the maintenance end, but how are we doing in terms of the readiness of these fleets? Yeah, well, I, I, I can speak for the Army. Uh, First of all, our fleets are, are very ready. Uh, our pilots are trained. Our aircraft are up. Um, you know, our three main aircraft, the Apache helicopter is the greatest attack helicopter in the world. Uh, the Black Hawk is the greatest medium lift, and then the Chinook is, is a heavy lift. And, uh, you know, I see them every single day uh, supporting our troops, and, and quite frankly, I think they do a great job of keeping those aircraft. The other thing is the, the safety record is at least in the United States Army, for aviation is at a historical high, which is pretty good, given the type of missions that they're, they're actually doing out there. Well, two last notes before we express our appreciation for your time today, sir. Um, the first is that um, Mike O'Hanlon has a new book out, a Military History for the Modern Strategist. It's an important read for all of us who are interested um, in national security, in the history of war, and the future of war. Um, so please do check that out. The other thing, uh, I'd encourage everybody to take a look at the Brookings Events webpage. Our federal executive fellows are hosting an event this coming Monday um, entitled The Future of Recruitment, Retention, and Education. Um, very important topics as we've discussed today. So please take a look for both of those things. And otherwise, please join me in thanking General McConville very much for spending some time with us today to, to share the status uh, of the U.S. Army, um, things that they've accomplished and are looking toward in the future. Thanks very much, sir. We appreciate Thank you. it. Thank and you. Thank you.